Hello and welcome. In this video series, we are going to take a look at the validity of arguments. And this is an application of Boolean logic. Um, so we can actually assess whether verbal or some sort of logical arguments are, are valid. And in this case, we'll look at some verbal arguments. So the definition of what we will call something as logically valid is if the conclusion is true whenever the hypotheses are true. So we know that the statement, if P then Q, will always be true in the circumstances where the P condition happens and the Q condition uh, immediately follows from it. So for instance, we know that if P is true and Q is true, that means the premise has happened, the conclusion has followed, therefore that is a true statement. Uh, if on the other hand, the premise does happen, but the conclusion is false, then that whole if-then statement is considered to be invalid. Now, the, the odd cases are those where the premise doesn't happen. So if the premise doesn't happen and the conclusion proves to be false, then that's a valid or true if-then statement. So this, this column right here, this true-false-true, true, establishes the validity of if P then Q as a whole structure. The individual trues and falses look at whether the premise is true and the conclusion is true. So additionally, we can say that whenever the premise is false, but the conclusion ends up being true, that's still a valid if then statement uh, because we haven't told a lie, in other words. Another way to think about this is, is whenever the conclusion happens, the conclusion or the premise happens, the conclusion must follow. So this is the basic idea behind an if-then statement, that basically the conclusion is always true and the hypothesis is true. But here's the thing, a, a premise could actually be built off of individual simple statements to form more compound statements. So even though we might write if P then Q, like this, if P then Q, that statement P can actually be a series of, sim of simple statements. So P could be a compound statement involving a bunch of statements P1 and P2 and P3 and etc. up to some nth statement in that sequence. And in order, first of all, for a series of and statements to be true, so that means that, for example, I could say uh, if the following conditions all hold, then this conclusion will happen. Well, that's an and statement. That's a conjunction of a bunch of simple statements. So whenever all of these individual simple premises are true, then we expect the conclusion to always follow. So let's look at a simple case. Let's say P is the statement P1 and P2 and P3. If I take a look at that in the truth, in a truth table, then whenever P1 and P2 and P3 are all true, then that means the, the premise has been satisfied. So our premise consists of three simple statements. So this could be like, if, if you clean your room and you uh, vacuum the house and you take out the trash, then, okay, so only when those three conditions are met can we make any conclusions about Q. And actually, let me make this a little bit simpler because this will create an astoundingly large truth table so we have uh, P1, we have P2, we have some sort of conclusion, which we'll call Q, and then we have the implication, the conditional, which says if P1 and P2, uh, oh, and we'll do one more column, and then we'll do if P1 and P2, remember this, this whole statement is just a compound, is one compound statement built up uh, off of uh, two simpler statements. So then Q. So if for these conditions we can say false, 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 uh, we know these can alternate between false and true. And we continue to fill this thing out, then only when P1 and P2 are both true does our premise pass, right? So in situations where we would have like, for example, true and true, that would mean P1 and P2, the, the premises have both been satisfied, so that's a true statement. 
Uh, the conclusion does follow in that case. Therefore, I would conclude that the if-then statement is valid. So let's take a look at some of these logical ones where we want to determine the validity of these statements. First, let's look at it sort of from an intuitive perspective. Either the Patriots or the Seahawks will win the Super Bowl. Uh, the Seahawks will not win the Super Bowl. Therefore, the Patriots will win the Super Bowl. Well, that seems to make sense because one of these two teams has to win. One of the teams will not win. Therefore, the other team must win. So this is a completely valid argument right here, but let's go ahead and assess it by using a truth table. So we're going to form two statements. We'll say, we'll say P is the statement that the Patriots, Patriots win. And we'll say Q is the statement that, or we'll say S to, so that reminds us that it's the Seahawks. S is uh, Seahawks win. And I hope you're not a Seahawks fan or a Patriots fan for that matter. Um, but uh, here we go. So we have those two statements. And so let me write each of these sentences in terms of these logical, logical expressions and in terms of their connectives. So either the Patriots or the Seahawks will win the Super Bowl. So that's an or statement. So the Patriots will win or the Seahawks will win, but it's an either or, right? Because only one of them can win. So this should actually be an exclusive or. So P or exclusive or S because only one of them will win. The Seahawks will not win the Super Bowl. So that's that we can think of as our, um, our second portion of the hypotheses that if either the Patriots or the Seahawks will win the Super Bowl is true and the Seahawks will not win the Super Bowl is true, then this final statement must happen. And the Seahawks will not win the Super Bowl in terms of S is just the statement not S. So I can write not S here. And the conclusion is that the Patriots will win the Super Bowl, and that's the statement P. So what we're basically saying, and you can kind of write this as an equation. You can say P exclusive or S and not S, then the conclusion will be that uh, P, the Patriots win. So in terms of evaluating the statement, we're going to build columns for P, S. So we'll have P and S here, and the values can be false, true, false, true for S, and then false, false, true, true for P. Now we have, um, do we have two hypotheses? We have two hypotheses. We can refer to this as what we were calling P1 earlier, and this is P2. So when, when P1 and P2 are both true, we need to ensure that the conclusion that the Patriots will win the Super Bowl follows as a result of that. So here we go. Uh, let's look at first P1, which is the statement P exclusive or S. So we have P exclusive or S. So an exclusive or is only true whenever exactly one of the um, the two simple statements is true. So this will be false, true, true, false. So at this point, to evaluate the validity of this argument, we only need to consider the situations where both premises, P1 and P2, are true. So in this first line, um, the exclusive or doesn't happen anyway. So the first premise fails, and therefore the entire if portion is unsatisfied or does not get satisfied as a result. The next thing we want to assess is not s. So that's a pretty simple one to do. We just invert the values of s. This will be true, false, true, false. So once again, the only place where both premises are true is here. So that's the only real situation in which we need to consider what is the conclusion. Um, yeah, so that, that's the only situation in which we need to consider the conclusion is where both of the hypotheses P1 and P2 are true. So if I create a third column to make this a little bit more explicit, then this third column, what it can have in it is P1 and P2. Okay, so I just care about where both of those hypotheses are true. And obviously that's going to be false here, false here, true here and false here. And the reason for that is, again, this is an, we want all of the hypothesis, uh, 
the simple statements of the hypothesis to be true. And then we want to check, is the conclusion going to be true as well? So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is P, that the Patriots win. Okay, well, here we can, we can totally ignore this row and this row and this row because of the fact that both premises have not been satisfied. And, and if then can only be invalid when the premise happens, but the conclusion doesn't follow. So here in the green, the, both of the premises have happened. What's the conclusion? Well, it's P. The, the value of P is true. And so we see that when the uh, both premises happen, the conclusion does always follow. So there's only one situation where that happens, but nonetheless, <clears throat> excuse me. And this makes sense because what happens in this row here? Well, the, this says that the Patriots win the Super Bowl and the Seahawks lose the Super Bowl. So is that is it the case that either one or the other has won? Yeah, it's true. Um, is it the case that the Super that the Seahawks did not win? Yeah, that's a true statement. So two things happened, either one or the other won. The Seahawks didn't win and the Patriots therefore did win. And that follows along with our logic. So let's take a look at another example. Um, here we have a slightly different situation and these logical statements can be applied to computer logic, to basically any sort of logic. These just happen to be sort of these real world sentences. So if the president wins California, then he will be reelected, but the president will lose California. Therefore, he will not be reelected. So first of all, we have to ask ourselves, um, does the fact that the president will lose California mean he won't be reelected? Well, the first statement just says that if the president does win California, uh, he is guaranteed to be reelected. But let's think about this. Just because he doesn't win California, he may be able to win some other states that give him enough electoral votes in order to be able to still be reelected. So it doesn't say that not winning California will lose to him not being reelected. It just says if he wins California, that's enough for him to, uh, to be reelected in that case. So we're going to claim that this is an invalid argument, that this Conclusion is not necessarily true that he won't be reelected. So let's come up with a couple of statements here. The president wins California. Um, so I'll just I'll label that as C, and that'll be the statement, the president wins California. And R will be the statement that uh, he will be reelected. And then every other statement is just some function of these two simple statements. So here we have, if the president wins California, so that's C, then he will be reelected. So C implies R. That's our statement that we're calling P1. So P1, I'm sorry, not P1. Yeah, P1. P1 is the statement, if the president wins California, then he will be reelected. The next statement is, the president will lose California. So that is uh, the negation of he will win California. And that's what we're calling hypothesis part two. Therefore, he will not be reelected. So this is the conclusion that we're claiming. As a result of P1 and P2 both happening, he will not be reelected re is the negation of that he will be reelected. And that's our statement Q right there. So again, we said that just because he doesn't win California, this does not guarantee that he won't be reelected. It just means that he won't win California. And it's, there, there could be other ways to win. So let's build our truth table for this. And so we'll have, again, we'll have a column for our two simple statements, C and R, false, false, true, whoops. That was our uh, alternating order. So we capture all of the possibilities. And now we're going to look at the first simple statement, which is the statement uh, C then R. So an if then statement is always going to be true unless C is true and R is false, which is right here. So therefore, the premise happened, but the conclusion didn't happen. And otherwise, it's always going to be true. Now, once again, this is statement P1 right here. So statement P1 and statement P2 both need to be true. Therefore, I can pretty much ignore this row down here, right? Because already I can see that one of the premises didn't happen 
And if one of the premises didn't happen, then the conclusion happening or not happening is, uh, is, is totally up in the air. Okay, so the next statement that we have to evaluate is not C, and that's just the negation of the C column. So that'll be true, true, false, false. And that is column P2. Now again, I only want to look at where both of the premise one and premise two are true. So I see that uh, both of them fail in this row, and premise true is not satisfied in the fourth row, so I don't even need to bother with evaluating the truth value of the conclusion for those two rows. Again, both premises have to be true for me to then check the conclusion. Because if both premises aren't true, then that leads to a, uh, a, a premise, a false premise, which always leads to a true uh, if-then statement. So here we go with the conclusion. Uh, well, before we do that, let's just evaluate P1 and P2. So P1 and P2 is true here, true here, false here, and false here. And so again, this is why we're not considering these two because not, it's not the case that both of the premises have been satisfied. So we'll continue to strike that through right there. And then for our conclusion, we we're gonna say that uh, he will not be reelected. So we have to look at not R as our conclusion. So not R, only looking at these two rows, so the negation of R will be true here. The negation of true will be false here. So I need to look at these two rows and I see a problem. Well, this is all good. The premise happened, but the conclusion and the conclusion followed. Or both of the premises happened and the conclusion followed. But in this second row, the, the premise, both premises happened, but the conclusion that I was claiming didn't occur. So it is true that both of these statements happened or occurred, but the conclusion didn't follow. So let's assess this row here. What happened? Well, he didn't win California, but he did get reelected. Oh, okay. So uh, he, if he wins California, then he will be reelected. Well, that's a true statement because um, if the premise is false, then it doesn't matter what the conclusion is. That's a valid if then statement. It is the case that he didn't win California. That's a true statement, but he was actually reelected. And so the claim that he will not be reelected is not a good one. So this is an invalid statement, or, or you could say false statement if you prefer. Okay, and so once again, another thing that we could do here is we could uh, state this kind of an equation form, we could say, if C then R, that's our first claim, or our first statement of our premise. Not C is our second, and we're saying that that leads to the conclusion of not being reelected. And this is, of course, a invalid or false statement, so not much to say there. Um, okay, so here's another one that we'll look at. So here we have actually uh, a, a different situation where I think we have uh, Marty working hard or not working hard and Marty passing a class. So Marty does not work hard. If Marty is to pass this class, then it is necessary that he work hard. Um, and therefore, Marty will not pass the course. So let's think about this. Uh, Marty does not work hard, okay? So if Marty is to pass this class, then it is necessary that he work hard, okay? So that is a, um, if Marty is gonna pass the class, then the conclusion is that he, he did work hard. Uh, so it is necessary that he work hard. That's the conclusion of this if, and it's not the other way around. It's not if he works hard, then he'll pass the class. It just says that in order for Marty to pass the class, the conclusion will be that he works hard. Okay, therefore, Marty will not pass the course. Okay, well, if Marty is to pass the course, then it's guaranteed that he work, he has worked hard, but Marty did not pass the course. Now, this is getting a little bit uh, trickier logically, and this is where we might see the use of writing out these statements. So our first statement, uh, P, is going to be the statement or uh, we'll just say M for Marty, 
Um, oh no, we have work hard and we have pass the class. So let's use let's use W for work hard. So Marty works hard. Now Pat uh, pass the class. We'll just say C for Marty passes the class. Um, notice that I you, you could in theory define one of these as Marty does not pass the class and call it C, but then it becomes confusing when you apply the negation because then it's Marty does not not pass the class and that's really weird. So I try to avoid negations in my statement definitions and then let the negation do that work for me. So here we have Marty does not work hard. Okay, so that means that's the negation of W. If Marty is to pass this class, so let's see, if Marty is to pass this class C, then it is necessary that he works hard, which is W. Therefore, Marty will not pass the class. Okay, so that is not C. So once again, I have a the first portion of my premise. Then also we're claiming that when that second portion happens as well, then it must follow that the conclusion is that Marty will not pass the class. So let's see if we can understand this by building out this truth table again. So we'll have two values. We'll have C and W. And I'm going to list them in that order to make it easier to assess this if C then W. And we'll have false, true, false, true, and then these guys here as well. Okay, so to assess not W, that's that's an easy one to do. Just uh, negate these values to true, false, true, false. And that's our P1. Uh, P2 will be the statement if C then W. Okay, so that will uh, be, that'll only be a false statement when the premise happens, but the conclusion doesn't for that individual if then statement. So that's a false true 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 and this is p2 now again i only need to make sure the conclusion holds whenever both of the premises hold so in the first row i see it holds that marty both does not work hard and the statement if marty is to pass this class and it is necessary that he work hard is true i now need to look at the conclusion Okay, so I'm not going to put a P1 and P2 column here because what that boils down to is only look at the rows where the premise, the both sub premises have been satisfied. The conclusion is that Marty will not pass the class. So that's just going to be the negation of this column over here. True, true, false, false. So we notice that when it is the case that both premises are true, which is only in this row, here we have false, true, true, false, false, true. We see that the conclusion does in fact happen when both premises are satisfied. So if Marty does not work hard, um, we know if we, if we know that, and if Marty is to pass this class, then it is necessary that he work hard. So a, a true pass would require a true work hard, but since he doesn't work hard, he can't pass the course. And that makes, that makes logical sense. So this ends up being a valid logical argument. And once again, the other way you may see this is um, not W and C implies W leads to the conclusion not C. And this is a true set of arguments. I will go ahead and do one more here. Okay, here we actually have three statements and even the Boolean algebra that we have to perform can get significantly more complex uh, whenever we have a number of statements because our truth table is going to be large. So if the instructor is good, then the course is interesting. Either the assignments are challenging or the course is not interesting. The assignments are not challenging, therefore the instructor is not good. This is obviously a harder one to assess by, by looking at it. If the instructor is good, then the course is interesting. Either the assignments are challenging or the course is not interesting. The assignments are not challenging. Wow, it's just a lot going on. Um, probably not a very good English paragraph, but we have three statements here. We have the instructor is good. So we'll just call this I, instructor is good. 
the course is interesting. So I'll say course, uh, course is interesting. And then we also have the assignments are challenging. So we'll just say A, oops, A is assignments are challenging. And now we can use these three constructs to put this together. So if the instructor is good, so that is if I, then the course is interesting, so then C, either the assignments are challenging or the course is not interesting. So that either implies that it's going to be one or the other, but not both. Um, so, uh, by the way, so either means only one, only one. So either the assignments are challenging, so that would be A, or, now that's going to be an exclusive or because it's an it's either one or the other, or the course is not interesting. Um, so that's not C. The assignments are not challenging, so that is the statement not A. Therefore, the instructor is not good, so that is not I. So we actually have three conditions here. P1 is the first statement, and we want premise when premise two occurs and when premise three occurs, we should get our conclusion if this is to be a valid statement. So this table is going to be a little bit more involved. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, just produce a quick table here. You don't have to watch me. All right, and so here I have that truth table written out. Uh, so the first statement that we need to assess is if I then C, and the only time that's going to be false is whenever I is true and C is false. Uh, so we can go ahead and look at that. And we see that, well, I is false here. So the if then will always be true. In fact, I is false in all of these. So the conclusion doesn't really matter. And the only situation where I is true but C is false is, are these two rows. So we have false, false, and then both the premise and conclusion are true here for this P1. And this is our truth table for that value. Now, not C will just be the negation of the C column. So that's true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. And the reason I need to not C is because P2, my second uh, statement as part of the premise, is A exclusive or not C. So as long as only one of A or C is true, the outcome is true. So A is false, but not C is true. That's true. Uh, both can't be true for an exclusive or. Both can't be false for an exclusive or. So we're looking at this column and this column. Uh, exactly one of them is true here. Exactly one of them is true here. Both of them are true. Both of them are false. And exactly one of them is true here. So, so far, again, we just need to focus on the situations where all of our premises are true. And so far, P1 is true. P2 is true in the first row. P1 is true and P2 is true in the fourth row. And P and that's the uh, and then P1 is true and P2 is true in the final row. So really we don't need to do anything with uh, with the second, third, fifth, sixth, and seventh rows because those are situations in which we're already not passing all of our premises. And so that means P1 and P2 and P3 will be a false statement, and whatever happens with the conclusion doesn't matter. So just, again, to assess validity of an argument, we just need to look at situations where all of the premises are true. And so we can do that with this final column here, P3, which is the negation of A. So that's just going to be the negation of the third column, true, false, true, false, true, false. True, false. And I didn't really even need to worry about these other ones, just the ones with the rows that are green. But now I see that P1, P2, and P3 are all true in the first row, but they're not all true in the uh, fourth row, so I'm not going to worry about that. that. That guy is out of the question because, again, not all the premises are true, and same thing here. So the only situation in which all my premises are true is just this top row here. So it better be the case that the conclusion is also true. Well, let's look at I. 
i is equal to false, so the negation of i is equal to true, and therefore, whenever all the sub-premises are true, the conclusion does automatically follow, and so this is a valid argument. Again, it's a very messy one. It's not one that you'd often use in the English language, but whenever you're writing a com complex bit of code and you really want to be able to follow whether your conclusion is, is, is a valid one, then you can set up statements similar to the ones that we're using for these English sentences to assess the validity of your argument. And um, that's something very powerful to be able to do in general, even when you're writing some sort of technical paper to make sure that your conclusions follow, you can essentially say, okay, when all of my premises were satisfied, does that guarantee that my conclusion happens? And as a last tidbit, um, what we could say here in terms of writing it in the equation style that you'll often see is I then C and A exclusive or not C and P3, which is not A, then the outcome should be not I. And we just figured out that that is true. So that's pretty much how we work with truth tables or how we can use truth tables and Boolean logic to help us assess things like grammar. And it's pretty cool. Um, again, when you're writing code, you might bump into this stuff. But in general, it's just good to be able to convert something into a form where you don't have to think so hard about the statement itself, but rather you can use the truth values of those statements to help us determine uh, whether, whether it's, it's a valid argument or not.